Okay. Thank you all for joining tonight. Um, I want to start this evening by um, doing a quick recap of where we left off last time um, with our post Maimonidean discussion. And Menachem Kellner has an interesting um, quote wherein he describes Maimonides' impact in kind of the dialectical. Um, we spent the earlier portion of the of our discussion talking a lot about Rambam. Um, certainly, certainly he was most prolific and influential um, with how people regard or how people conceive of Yudgimu Ikarim um, or the principles of faith. When I asked the question at the very beginning of our discussions, um, we talked about, are there in fact obligatory beliefs? And the ones that you could point to were um, Yudgimu Ikarim that are said often after um, Shachrit, that which is commemorated in Yigdal, and the most uh, famous or well-known were Rambam's 13 principles that we analyzed extensively in his Pirushim Shneyot. And so Menachem Kellner, who's the contemporary Jewish philosopher who's done the most work on dogma, um, he writes provocatively in, in his book, Must Did You Believe Anything? He says, the impact of Maimonides' position that in short, Judaism has dogmas in the strictest sense of the word was monumental and pervasive while at the same time negligible. Okay, so it's interesting the way he frames it, the impact of Maimonides, right? The systemization of dogmas in Judaism was monumental and pervasive on the one hand, while at the same time negligible. So it's an interesting um, framework. And we certainly saw the impact that Maimonides had being the first, um, to really kind of concretize um, the the um, Yilgim Karim, um, that which he didn't necessarily feel was innovating anything, but minimally he was articulating explicitly that which was kind of taken for granted or kind of um, implied in biblical and rabbinic literature. Um, so certainly that impact was long lasting, even if not authoritative, even if not completely pervasive, it was long lasting since we still think about it. We still, that's the most familiar um, delineation of dogma that we have today. But at the same time, Kellner argues, and we began to saw, see last week, and we'll continue to see this week, that his impact or his influence was somewhat negligible. And despite the long lasting influence, we see that many people, and we started seeing this last week, don't agree with Rambam on a number of levels. Number one, with regard to his enumeration of these 13 as an exhaustive list or not other beliefs. Uh, we see that plenty don't agree with him in terms of the obligatory status of these beliefs. Perhaps these are what one ought to believe, but not necessarily what one is obligated to believe so much so that one would be punishable if they denied it. Many, as we saw last week, disagreed with his conception of accidental heresy. If one inadvertently or unintentionally comes to a wrong belief, one should not be punishable. We saw that um, in, the, in the comments of Duran last time. Um, and also just in terms of the negligibility of his or the lack of um, 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 authority of his views, even though we do have kind of a lasting impact of the Gimli Karim, it's in somewhat superficial ways, right? The Yigdal or the Anima means that we say after Javaning, even if it preserves the spirit of Rambam's ideas, they kind of simplify a much more philosophically sophisticated um, conceptual scheme. And they were not necessarily accepted or they didn't necessarily have the staying power with which Rambam intended when he really sought to articulate more intricate forms um, what one should believe and how one should ameliorate misconceptions or erroneous beliefs. And so we're going to see, as we continue today, how many objected, specifically we're going to look at Hasek Restas, who was one of the most vehement anti-Aristotelians, 
um, we're going to see significant objections to um, Rambam's beliefs and even the idea of whether or not beliefs could be commanded altogether. Um, and so, as we mentioned last time in our introduction to the post maimonidean uh, Jewish philosophers, the whole debate over dogma or the whole discussion of dogma was largely, largely ignored for two centuries after uh, Rambam published his Yudhim Karim. And it was only revisited in the 15th century in Iberia in defense of Judaism against the Christian persecutors. And we see that it was only as a result of kind of the um, confusion among the Jewish um, community and their inability to uniformly defend their faith that once again, this discussion of dogma that Rambam had taken up two centuries before, once again, it became prevalent. But it wasn't prevalent amongst the Jewish philosophers. It wasn't prevalent among those Jewish rationalists or Sicilian philosophers, but rather it was prevalent among the Jewish philosophers who also held rabbinic and communal roles in the community and sought to have kind of leadership influence and felt the need as a result of what was going on in their historical context, as a result of what was going on with regard to persecutions and forced conversions, they felt the need to help all of their Jewish co-religionists defend their faith and articulate in a uniform way what Judaism stands for and combat the arguments or the accusations that were being um, thrown at them by the Christian persecutors and those who were trying to coerce their conversion. So we saw that last week with Duran, We'll see this this week with Chastai Kreskas, another uh, Jewish philosopher who also held a significant rabbinic and political role in 15th century Iberia. We'll see it next week with Kreskas' student, Yosef Albo, and then we'll see it the week after with Isaac Rabinel. And that will kind of round out the late medieval Jewish philosophical discussion on dogma. And so it's these um, individuals because of the communal pressures that they were motivated to teach their generation how to defend themselves in the face of their attacks. And therefore we saw last week with Shimon ben Samach Duran, he argued against Rambam in a number of significant ways. Number one, he took issue with Rambam's enumeration of 13 Karim and instead kind of whittled them down to three basic categories. We saw the three principles he held of revelation, reward and punishment, and the existence of God. And from those, he had other derivative principles to make more of a hierarchical system than Rambam had. We also saw Duran take major issue with um, Maimonides with regard to accidental heresy. Whereas Maimonides said that it doesn't matter what one's intentions are, as long as you're a Jew, one needs to be defined by the propositions that one maintains, therefore, if one denies any of the 13 Ikarim, regardless of intentions, even if you um, had good intentions and took the Torah literally and came to an erroneous um, um, belief, one is um, out. One who denies, regardless of one's intentions, is excluded from Bal Israel and denied, uh, um, um, is deprived of one chilek in olam haba. Again, for Rambam, as we saw, human perfection is intellectual perfection, and therefore, um, olam haba is an intellectual state, and without the proper intellectual preparation, one's not able to survive in olam haba. So more than a punishment, it's a consequence for Rambam, and therefore, Rambam says it doesn't matter one's intentions if one doesn't hold the right beliefs. He should not be included in Sal Yisrael, and therefore, is deprived of a chilek in olam haba. We saw last time Duran took issue with that and said, no, accidental heresy, um, intentions matter. And just like we have the concept of Bishoge with regard to halacha, so do we have the concept of Bishoge with regard to beliefs. And even if one denies a belief, if one is well intended, they need to do tshuva, but one is not excluded from a chilev and haba. So we're going to see Duran's positions extended a little bit, bit further today with that of his contemporary, um, Chastai Kreskas. And Chastai Kreskas objected to Rambam's Yugimel Ikarim um, and really objected more largely to Rambam's philosophy and especially the Aristotelian influence within Rambam's philosophy in his work. 
Now, Chastai Kreskas wrote his major work was called Or Hashem, or Light of the Lord. He also wrote a refutation to Christian dogmas um, that included a lot of objections to Aristotelian philosophy um, in that work, again, because he had this communal and rabbinic and political role in his society and not just the philosophical one. But in the light of the Lord in Or Hashem, he really um, takes issue with Rambam Zuki Mali Karim. Um, Kreskas lived at the same time as Duran. He died in 1412. And he structured his major work, Light of the Lord, and it was originally intended as a two-volume work. And he really hoped that it would kind of supplant the Moran of Prim. It never achieved that philosophical status, and it never achieved that pervasive influence that he had intended or that he had, you know, aspired for. But he structured his work, Light of the Lord, or, or, or Hashem, he structured it according to uh, his system of dogma which was a multi-tiered hierarchical system of dogma as opposed to Rambam, who just had these 13 seemingly kind of equal um, um, principles of beliefs, of, 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 of faith. And so Kreskas has four different treatises within this hierarchical system of dogma. The first one he calls Shorashim. And these, Shoresh is like from the word root. So these are roots of religious beliefs or what he considers to be beliefs that are presupposed by religion. And he enumerates three of them, God's existence, his unity, and his own corporeality, which are the same as Rambam's first three in the Moran Abukim. But then in the second treatise of Or Hashem, he describes the second category in this hierarchy, he calls Pinot. And Pinot are cornerstones, right? A Pinot is a corner. Pinot are cornerstones of the Torah, or beliefs that are implied by Torah Minu Shemayim, or Torah um, from heaven. The third treatise he describes, the next level of the hierarchy, he describes as true beliefs that are taught by the Torah and must be accepted, but their denial does not lead to a collapse of the Torah. And we'll see what each of these categories entail. And then the fourth treatise at the fourth level are 13 religious questions, not conclusively answered by the Torah and by tradition, but these are beliefs, the acceptance or rejection of which is not determined by the Torah, but by reason alone. Now, Kreskas, as I mentioned before, is considered anti-Aristotelian from a Jewish philosophical perspective. And he objects to Rambam's Aristotelian influence that focuses on the intellect. And as I mentioned before, Rambam, as we remember, he talks about the four levels of human perfection and the ultimate level of human perfection. We saw this in the very final chapter of the Moran of Prim, that level of perfection that makes man, man, meaning that's unique to the human species, and that enables him to achieve immortality is when he, the human being has perfected his intellect, has learned and understand as much as possible, as much as he is capable of about God and about divine things. And this human perfection is what Rambam conceives of as intellectual perfection. And this is what gives him the necessary requirements to achieve immortality on Olam Haba, because again, Rambam conceives of Olam Haba as an intellectual state. Now, Kreskas, an anti-Aristotelian, objects to Rambam's conception of human perfection altogether and immortality in Olam Haba, because Kreskas argues that God would not make human perfection and therefore immortality in Olam Haba only attainable by the intellectual elite. And so Kreskas, we're going to see, kind of reverts back to a much more pure, a much more rabbinic conception of human perfection. And that is focused on not intellectual development, but rather spiritual perfection, religious perfection. What does that entail? Performance of the mitzvot. That is how one connects with God. That's how one achieves perfection. That's how one connects with God immortally. But in the beginning of his introduction to the Or Hashem, he first begins with a different objection towards Rambam. And the objection that he first makes towards Rambam, which kind of sets the stage for all of his later discussion and his you know, more specific delineation of, the, of, of, of um, his hierarchical state uh, system of dogma is the question of, can one be commanded to believe? But for just to ask you the question, without thinking of Rambam, without thinking of Prescott, just from your perspective, do you believe when thinking about your conception of belief, can one be commanded to believe? Why or why not? Why would you argue if you believe that one can be commanded to believe? Why would you argue 
that one can be commanded. And if you feel like one cannot be commanded to believe, what's the rationale behind that assertion? Any ideas? Have you ever thought about that? Are you commanded to believe? It was kind of the first question that we started out this, this, um, this series. Are we obligated in our beliefs or just in our actions, right? We can understand that one could be commanded not to kill, not to steal, but can one similarly be commanded to believe in certain things or to not believe in other things? Does anyone have any perspective, any, any initial thoughts, any initial reflections when you think about your own beliefs? Can one be commanded and thereby obligated to believe? Thoughts, ideas, conceptions, not all at once. I'll, I'll start by throwing out the idea of why not? Why not? Why can't you be commanded to believe? Yeah, well, I mean, why, why should that, by definition, be any different from being commanded to perform an act? Okay. Or so, that you have an obligation to do something. So it's in essence saying that, you know, in all cases, it's a function of, of human understanding and actions and activity. And, uh, and, you know, requiring human intellect to do something should be no different um, by definition than requiring the human body to do something, for example. Excellent. Thank you, Mark, for once again being the one to, <laughs> to, to participate. Um, any, any responses to Mark? Because uh, then I'll ask Mark a follow-up question if he doesn't mind. Any responses? Anyone feel differently or the same? Uh, anyone want to further Mark's point or anyone want to... Um, to counter, but Mark or anybody, um, is there a difference between me telling you, "Thou shall not commit adultery," "Thou shall not kill," and "Thou shall believe that two plus two is five? What would you say is the difference between commanding an action versus commanding a belief? Do you see a difference there? I, I don't, and in fact, it's the two plus two equals five is great because. Um, you know, maybe you can, can, maybe you can be obligated, maybe you can require someone to actually believe that. How do I know that two plus two equals four? You know, what makes that so, so um, definitionally objective in terms of that? And maybe that's exactly what um, commanding belief is about. It's about insisting on, uh, on a principle, even if that principle may, you know, for whatever reason, smack against some um, objective, um, physical, um, reality. Sure. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so this is precisely what Prescott was arguing against. Rambam believes that one can command belief. And he even enumerates this in his Sefer HaMitzvot, in the very first principle, uh, sorry, in the very first mitzvot of faith, in his book of mitzvot, he says, Mitzvah say Aleph, he says, the first commandment is his command to us to believe in the divinity. That is that there is a transcendent essence, which is the cause of everything that exists. And he uses the proof text, the supporting pasuk, from the first of the Aser Dibros, Anoch Yishem Lokecha, from Shmot Perakaf in Yitro, is a statement of this command. Okay, so Rambam enumerates, and Rambam agrees with you, Mark, one can be commanded to believe, and not only that, it's the very first of all of the positive commandments in the Torah. In the Sefer Mitzvot, he enumerates belief in the existence of God is the first commandment of the Torah. Now, Kreskas takes issue with Maimonides and with Mark on two levels. Number one, he begins by objecting to Rambam's claim that belief in God is a commandment because he feels that all Jews must believe in God, but that acceptance of God's existence is not a command, but it's rather a presupposition of all religious beliefs. Because he says, if, if you believe in commands, you already must believe in a commander, right? So if you believe that you are obligated to do X, Y, and Z, it's kind of a prerequisite belief that you believe in a commander, because otherwise you wouldn't feel obligated to believe in you know, whatever else, or to obey whatever other, other commandments. If you didn't believe in a commander, you wouldn't feel an obligatory, you wouldn't feel obligated to fulfill the other mitzvot, to fulfill the other commandments, or to um, not violate the other prohibitions. 
And so he said that the leap in the existence of God is not something that you have, you're commanded to, but it's kind of like a prerequisite, a presupposition of all the rest of religious beliefs. Mark, did you want to interject? Uh, yeah, I, I said on a, on a pure philosophical basis. Yeah. Let's say for argument's sake there, we, we all accept that there's a belief in a commander. What if the commander commanded you not to believe in the commander? Right. Well, then we're getting into a bit of a circular argument, but yes. I hear right, you. but I'm saying, but it, it has that same element to it. Yeah. So, you know, it's a... Yeah. Uh... But with regard to the two plus two is five, that comes into Rambam's, sec uh, I'm sorry, Prescott's second objection to Rambam. And he says, in addition to it just being kind of a presupposition of all religious beliefs, that's his first objection. His second objection is that you can't be commanded to believe meaning from a psychological perspective, because according to Crestas, you can't choose to believe and you can only be commanded over that which you choose, right? So if you have compelling evidence for something, you're going to automatically believe in it. And if you found compelling evidence to the contrary, you're going to not believe in that. So it doesn't matter, he says, psychologically, right? It's not that you're choosing to believe as you are choosing not to kill or not to steal or to do any of the positive act active physical mitzvot. But he says that when it comes to commands, one can only be commanded to believe what one has choice over. One can only be commanded to do that which one can choose. And if you can't choose, right, commandments only make sense if we feel free to act. And in context in which we're not um, aware of being determined. So regarding beliefs, when we feel compelled, when we adopt or reject certain beliefs, if we find evidence that's compelling, we don't feel like we can choose to not believe, right? We feel like this is compelled and therefore the Torah doesn't command belief according to Kreskas because there are certain beliefs that we must just logically accept if we accept the Torah. So from a psychological perspective and also from a philosophical perspective, Kreskas argues that one cannot be commanded to believe, but rather the belief is just kind of a prerequisite against our will type. If we're accepting the Torah, we're accepting a believer, uh, uh, we're accepting a commander, and therefore we feel obligated to um, do the rest of God, to obey the rest of God's commandments. And so we see that Crescas argues this point in light of the Lord. You can see it in his own words here. He says, the foundation of beliefs and the root of first principles, which direct one to the knowledge of truth concerning the cornerstones of the divine Torah is belief in the existence of God. In that the root of the first principles of the divine Torah is belief in the existence of God. It is self-evident that the Torah is arranged and commanded by an arranger and a commander. And its being divine means nothing other than its arranger and commander was God. Thus, he who counted belief in God's existence as a positive commandment committed a notorious error. This is so because commandments are relational and no commandment can be supposed without a known commander. Okay, so again, it's kind of like a cyclical, right? If you're believing in the um, commandments, then you have to believe in a commander. So one of the commandments cannot believe, be the existence of a commander because that's presupposed in your belief or your observance of the rest of the commandments. Yaakov, are you, do you have a question? I was saying maybe it's defense of Rambam, at least against the second attack, that maybe the requirement to a belief is exact, like, you know, Prescott says, okay, the, you know, if you gather evidence for something, you just have to believe it. You don't have control over what you believe. If you're compelled by the evidence, maybe the the requirement, the belief is just the requirement to only collect evidence that supports the belief. Okay. Yeah. And well, Maimonidean scholars attempt to reconcile Rambam's opinion, not just with regard to this objection of can you really be commanded to believe or should it really be enumerated as the first of the of the mitzvot if you're really not in control of your beliefs, but also because of seeming contradictions where uh, um, that we see in the Mishnah Torah and the Moran Abuchim. And so Maimonidean scholars try to explain that what Rambam really meant, even though he uses the word Lehe Amin in the Sefer Mitzvot, right? In, the, in that first mitzvah, he says, 
that it's hamitzvah rishona lahamin halohut, right? To believe in the divinity, lahamin generally means emuna, belief. However, the Sefer Mitzvah was written in Judeo Arabic. And Maimonides, therefore, Maimonidean scholars claim, in order to kind of reconcile or kind of respond to Prescott's objection, they say that Maimonides seems to equate belief and knowledge. And in the Sefer Mitzvot and also in the Morning of Bukhim, he uses the Arabic word itakhad. Um, and that can be translated as to believe, but it also is commonly translated as to know. Um, and therefore, it's used that way in the Morena Bukhim. And so if you look at another source in Morena Bukhim to try to kind of reconcile these two approaches of the Rambam or to make Rambam a little bit more consistent or uh, respond to Kreskas's objection, it says in the Morena Bukhim with regard to belief in book one, chapter 50, Rambam says belief is only possible after apprehension conviction that the thing apprehended has its existence in reality exactly as perceived in the mind. So once one has some sort of belief in one's head, one then has to gain knowledge of it to make sure that what one has the conception of his head is also um, um, consistent with what one observes and learns about in reality. And secondly, in the Mishnah Torah, in Hilcha Yisrodei HaTorah, in the very, very first chapter, Rambam writes here, the foundation of foundations and firmest pillar of all wisdom is to know, and then it uses the word in Hebrew because the Mishnah Torah is written in Hebrew, leda, that there is a first being, that he calls all beings, uh, that he caused all beings to be, and that all beings from heaven and earth and from between them could not be if not for the truth of his own being. So from the other references in Rambam's works in both the Morning of and the Mishnah Torah, it really seems that the focus for Rambam is on knowledge. And therefore, they go back, Maimonidean scholars, and reinterpret the word itakad from the Sefer Mitzvot to say, well, the very first mitzvah, the mitzvah to say, according to Rambam, was not just to believe, you know, blindly, meaning that which one doesn't really, might not have real control over from a psychological perspective, but really what Rambam was saying the mitzvah to say was, was to actively learn, study, know God, and therefore um, come to that belief, meaning through one's observations of God's world, God's creations, et cetera, et cetera, one can come to know him. And that's going to be consistent with how we understand love of God, which we'll see at the end of this year tonight. So uh, this is a quick question. And, and, and I know maybe we, we talked about this earlier. I apologize if we've covered no. this before. But for, for Rambam, is this an absolute knowledge or is it relative to each individual's ability? When so that... That's, right. that, that's the question. Yeah. So when it comes, so in the in the um um the the final chapter of the Morning of Fame in book in book three, chapter fifty four, when he talks about the ultimate human perfection, he does say according to one's capacity, um, and that's why um, Maimonideans could object to um, press passes and other anti Maimonideans or anti Aristotelians um, objection that it can't just be that human perfection or alam haba or immortality is only achievable by the intellectual elite. Rambam was saying that everybody needs to at least minimally, and this is how um, we saw a quote from J. David Blech a couple of weeks ago, these Yudim Likarim, according to Rambam, was just to kind of correct um, um, the masses from having erroneous conceptions of God. And this is kind of the prerequisite, the minimal requirements to achieve some level of intellectual perfection, some level of um, the intellectual prerequisites that were necessary for olam haba. And therefore, every individual should do it according to one's capacity. So there's even kind of a harsh chapter in one of the um, on that talk about in 136, talks about uh, incorporeality, that even the masses, even the women, even the children can gain some understanding from a philosophical perspective of the nature of God's incorporeality, and one shouldn't have to be relegated to kind of this kind of very uh, rudimentary uh, anthropomorphic understanding of God. And so it is according to one's capacity, but one really needs to strive to develop one's intellect according to one's ability. That might be different for you than it is for me, but one each needs to strive. And we talked about this also with regard to divine providence. Rambam says that 
God's providence is dependent upon one's intellectual development. And so you might have a far greater capacity to develop your intellect than I do, but if you choose not to develop your intellect, whereas I choose to, even in a much more limited way, according to my capacity, I'll merit divine providence and you won't, even if your intellectual development is uh, just on a higher level than mine because of your, because of your um, abilities and capacities. And so it, it very much is according to, you know, often, you know, Rambam is, is uh, critiqued of being elitist in that way. And um, that's certainly one of the arguments that Kreskov and others made in terms of focusing more on the spiritual perfection as opposed to intellectual perfection. But even Rambam uh, talks about with regard to intellectual perfection, it is according to the individual's capacity. Um, and one just needs to strive to understand even on a minimal level that which one can in order to uh, merit Olam Haba. So we see that um, even Maimonidean scholars will kind of reconcile Ram, uh, Kreskas's objection with regard to belief in, in um, or the command um, or to believe. So if we go on after he objects to that basic presupposition of religion um, in Rambam, Kreskas goes on in his preface to Light of the Lord to delineate the four treatises and thereby the four levels of his multi-tiered um, system of dogma. And he says there in, in, in Or Hashem, he says the four treatises, the first deals, this is in his preface in the Light of the Lord, Or Hashem, he says, the first deals with the first root, which is the first principle of all the Torah beliefs. The second deals with the beliefs which are cornerstones and foundations of all the commandments. The third deals with the true views which we who believe in the Torah ought to believe. And the fourth deals with those theories which the mind tends to accept. So then he devotes each of these treatises to different, um, um, different levels of this hierarchy. Okay, so the first one, which um, are the first principle of all Torah beliefs, God's existence, unity, and immorality, like we saw in but he says the second treatise is what he describes as pinot, as cornerstones. And look at what he enumerates as these cornerstones. And more significantly, look at what he doesn't. So this next layer is, he describes as pinot, lack of one of them, the entire Torah would collapse. So these are kind of like foundational beliefs that he believes the whole Torah is predicated upon. God's knowledge of existence, God's providence over them, God's power, God's prophecy, choice, and purpose of the Torah. What's significant here, and what's not significant here, I mean, you can see a lot of overlap with with, with uh, Rambam Zidim Karim, certainly God's knowledge of existence. We talked about that in the latter four of Rambam 13 Karim, his providence over them. We talked about that with regard to reward and punishment. Rambam doesn't exclusively enumerate his power, although perhaps that's taken into consideration. Um, what's interesting here in number five, and this is very complicated and then many scholars have written on it, he includes choice here. And this, a lot of Maimonidean scholars also write on the fact that Rambam doesn't include choice in like creation in his Yudhim Karim. Mm -hmm. Rambam seems to assert free choice in a number of places, especially in his Mishnah Torah, although there is some debate over the nature of Rambam's conception of choice among scholars. But what's significant here is Kreskas's inclusion of choice, especially because Kreskas was perceived as a determinist philosopher, at least as a soft determinist philosopher. So Ram, uh, Kreskas does um, believe that there is physical causality in the world, but he does maintain his notion of reward and punishment, divine justice, and with regard to the emotions one feels towards one's action. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but what's interesting to, to just uh, point out is his inclusion of choice to some extent in his, in his Ikari. Um, the third treatise, he goes on to describe true beliefs. And he describes these as if one denies them, they're considered sectarians, but he still considers this a lower level or less fundamental than the pinots. So belief in the Torah is conceivable 
without these, meaning so it's not a foundational principle like the Pinot's, but it has the same religious value as the Pinot's and therefore one's considered a sectarian for denying them. And so look at what he includes in this category, creation of the world. Again, that was something that may have been inferred in Rambam's Ikarim, but not explicit because of how pervasive Aristotelian's, the Aristotelian conception of Kamut Olam or the eternity of the world was at that time. He includes immortality of the soul, reward and punishment, resurrection of the dead, eternity of the Torah, the difference between Moshe's and other prophets. The Kohen Gadol is addressed through the Urim and Tumim and the coming of the Messiah. So it's interesting, again, what Kreskas includes here, which are not included in Yudgimali Karim of Rambam, and why he feels that these should be considered um, of having such significant religious value. And within this third category as well, he describes three more beliefs that are dependent on specific commandments. Number one, that God answers prayers and priestly blessing. Number two, the efficacy of tshuva. And number three, the uh, kind of power of Yom Kippur to arouse the worship of God. And lastly, the fourth of the, the treatises, the lowest level for Kreskas in the light of the Lord, he describes traditional doctrines and conjectures which the mind tends to accept, meaning these are not explicit in the Torah, but these were discussed, these uh, questions were discussed in Kreskas' day. And so these last category is, is the world eternal a part post, meaning eternal going forward, meaning in the future? Can another world or worlds exist? Are spheres living or rational? Do movements of heavenly bodies influence human fate? Do amulets or charms have effects on human activity? Demons, can human souls move? Is uneducated youth soul immortal? Paradise and hell, does Masa Breshit refer to physics and Masa Merkavas to metaphysics? That was explicit in um, Rambam's Morin uh, Abuchim in Hakdama. Are intellect, intellectually cognizing subject and object identical? Prime mover, impossibility of knowing God's essence. And since the correct position on these issues, positive or negative, was not explicit in the Torah, we shall investigate them by showing elements of probability on each side so the reader can distinguish which is correct. You'll notice that with regard to a lot of these last ones, these are in kind of direct, um, this is his direct motivation to address many of the concepts that Rambam articulated or that were prevalent among Aristotelian philosophers and that he felt the need to address during this, um, during a generation, during, a, during a, a time period when Aristotle's influence was very pervasive. So we see in this hierarchy, we see that the first principle of all the Torah's beliefs and commandments, this is the, what he calls the Shorashim, or the presuppositions of revelation, God's existence, unity, and incorporeality. And then we see the next level, the pinot. These are cornerstones that are taught by the Torah, foundations for all the commandments. And if God commands them, he must have knowledge of who he's commanding, and he must have a will expressed in these commandments. He has the power to reward and punish. And then the third one, these are the deot amitot. These are the true beliefs, which are not cornerstones. They're not foundations, but they're still true, and they're taught by the Torah. And then the lowest level, the deot usvarot, these are beliefs concerning which teaching the Torah is not necessarily conclusive. These were debated in Kreskas's time, but which the mind tends to accept. And Kreskas, by asking these questions and discussing proofs, he is showing what one should believe with regard to these very prevalent and debatable concepts that were discussed in Rambam and in, 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 in later generations. Now, Kreskas, as he enumerates these, these, um, these layers in his system, he thinks Rambam's 13 is either too long or too short, meaning if Rambam meant by his Yogi Muli Karim, the pinot, the cornerstones of the Torah, that which, if you take them away, the whole Torah would crumble, then the 13 are too long. You don't need each of those 13. You can't say that each one of Rambam's Yudhim and Likarim is necessary to, to um, bolster, to support the, the Torah. But if Maimonides meant by his Yudhim and Likarim, beliefs, denial of which 
constitute heresy, then it's too short because there are other beliefs. Rambam to Gimel Karim is not an exhaustive list. There are other beliefs that if one denies, one should be considered a heretic. So Rambam and Kreska seem to be asking different questions. Rambam seemed to be asking, what must one believe in order to be counted as a Jew, in order to merit ulam haba? And Kreska sought to delineate those beliefs which were analytic to the concept of divinely revealed Torah. What concept must one believe in order to believe properly in revelation and in God as the revealer? And so we see from his system that Kreska is more like Duran. Just like Duran argues that there's no difference between denying the principle of the Torah or any other belief in the Torah, and there's no kind of derivative relationship between beliefs, as we're going to see in Algo. For, for, for Rambam, no, he says these are the kind of essential beliefs that kind of um, define one as a Jew. And if one doesn't hold any of these, it doesn't matter one's attention, intention. If you deny these explicit 13, you uh, deny what it means to be a Jew. And because of there are different ways of conceiving of the principles, that's why one could argue, even though Prescott does not explicitly articulate a position on accidental heresy, like we saw Duran last week and like we're going to see Albo next week. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of surmise from what Prescott says in other contexts that anyone who denies even one of the beliefs that Kreskas lists as principles is a sectarian, but intentions do seem to matter like Duran. So how do we know, even though um, Kreskas doesn't explicitly address the accidental heretic, how do we know that according to Kreskas, intentions do matter? How do we know that there might be more leniency for Shkaga than there is for intentionally denying um, one of the Yudhi Mulikari or any of the, uh, of the beliefs. Look at how Kreskas, even though he's anti Aristotelian, even though he's anti Maimonidean in some ways, objecting to a number of Rambam's points, look at how he regards Rambam in his introduction. He says here, and among them at their head, he's talking about those who deny, among them at their head was the great master, our Rabbi Moses bin Maimon, who even with the greatness of his intellect, the extraordinarily encompassing scope of his Talmudic knowledge and the breadth of his mind when he meditated upon the books and discourses of the philosophers, they seduced him and he was seduced. From their weak premises, he made columns and foundations to the mystery of the law in his guide of the perplexed. Now, whereas the intent of the master in this was desirable, there have arisen today rebellious servants and they have turned into heresy the words of the living God. So we see that um, Kreska seems to have a little bit of, I wouldn't say sympathy, but he does show that even though he objects to Rambam, he does kind of pinpoint the error in Rambam's ways. And it was because of this Greek influence. It was because, and, and Kreska sees this as very dangerous, but it was because Rambam was misled, as he put it, by the Aristotelian influence that caused him to misunderstand. And he built his columns, he built his foundations, he built his hikarim upon these, um, this, these misperceptions. So Rabbam, he says, was kind of led, even though he's you know, um, intellectually you know, great, as he says, extraordinarily encompassing the scope of his Talmudic knowledge, he says the, the discourses of the philosophers, namely the Aristotelian philosophy, it seduced him. And therefore, from these weak premises, he says, he developed the foundations and the principles of faith. He developed his conceptions in erroneous ways in the Morinable Kane. And he says, whereas the intent of Rambam was desirable, right? Rambam was well intended. His followers, his students, no longer have those proper intentions of trying to really get at the heart of what the Torah was saying. And they took his ideas and they um, turned it into heresy. And so Kreskas is showing more sympathy for the proper intentions, even if one is misguided, even if, is one, if one is led in, an, in erroneous ways. 
But those who deliberately rebel, those who deliberately deny, he doesn't have the same uh, sympathy or the same forgiveness. So even though Crescas somewhat exonerates Maimonides from well-intendedly coming to mistaken conceptions as a result of those Aristotelian influence, he condemns those followers of Rambam in, in, in um, promoting the heresy. So Crescas, we can see, we can put him more in line with the Duran position, position taking intentions into consideration more so than we can see Rambam's kind of hard and fast rule and that of um, Babago and that we're gonna see of Rabbi Benel saying, there's no room for intentions. All that matters is if one um, follows or if one, if one believes or if one denies. And therefore there doesn't need to uh, necessarily be leniency with regard to intentions. Now Kreskas opposed Rambam's conception of a Jew um, that was defined according to these very rational propositions and his conception, as we saw, of human perfection and the achievement of Olam Haba in purely intellectual terms. So what we see at this point in Jewish intellectual history is Kreskas is reverting back to the classic rabbinic conception of man's proper relationship with God. He feels like as a result of these very kind of dangerous foreign intellectual influences like Aristotelian philosophy, people were philosophers, Rambam, other, others of Rambam's uh, followers were kind of deviating further and further as a result of these foreign influences from classical Judaism. And therefore, Kreskas, in his attempt in Or Hashem to kind of supplant the Morna theme, he's trying to revert back to this classic rabbinic conception, this pure relationship with God that's based on love. And so he was trying to resist as an anti-Aristotelian, he was trying to resist the Greek thought and he was trying to revert to this purely Jewish approach, not the intellectual love that Rambam describes in his Mishnah Torah. So if you look at the Mishnah Torah in a number of places, and this is consistent with what we saw with Rambam's philosophy in general, with his conception of human perfection, Rambam conceives of love of God in intellectual terms. In the Mishnah Torah, in Hilcho Yisodeya Torah, in Perak Bechelach Habet, Rambam says, Okay, so um, Rambam asks, how does one come to love God? And the time that one reflects, one contemplates on, on God's creations, on God's actions, and all of the wondrous things that God has made, one will immediately see from them, the Yeramahim Chochmato, one will immediately recognize God's Chochmah, She'en Erch locates that it's boundless, that there's, it's infinite, that there's no um, limits to it. And immediately, and one will come to love God and praise God and desire to know more and more about him. And similarly, Rambam also says in the Mishnah Torah, in Hilchad Tshuva, in Parag Yud Halachavav, he says, You can't love God except with the knowledge that one learns about him. And according to, commensurate with one's knowledge of him, one will love him. If you know God a little bit, you'll love him a little bit. If you know God a lot, you love him a lot. Right? And so therefore, man needs to isolate himself, to contemplate, to study, to learn, to um, um, understand the wisdom of God and the understanding of creation according to one's capacity, the human's capacity to understand and to attain that knowledge. So the more one learns about God, the more one understands God's creations and through God's under, understanding God's creation, one can understand the creator. The more one contemplates God's world and God's actions, the more one will come to love God. 
So each of these references in the Mishnah Torah is consistent with what we saw with regard to human perfection in the Moran of Uchim, and it's also consistent to what we saw um, in, with regard to the command to believe, right? One could argue, according to these references, that when we are commanded to believe in God, when we're commanded to love God, again, we can't necessarily be in control of our emotions or our beliefs, but one could argue, according to these references, that the more one studies God, we can be commanded in terms of study, in terms of amassing knowledge, in terms of observing. And the more we learn about God, the more we can come to love God, the more one we can come to believe in God. However, we see for Kreskas, that's not the ultimate goal. For Kreskas, as he objects to the intellectual focus of Aristotelian philosophy and of Maimonidean philosophy, Kreskas is saying that one needs to come to love God, but we come to connect with God. We come to um, engage in, 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 our in our own human perfection to connect with God. We come not through an intellectual love, but rather we come through the love of God achieved through the observance of his mitzvot. And therefore, similar to what we saw in Duran last week, the centrality for Kreskas like Duran is on the centrality of the Torah, as opposed to the Maimonidean centrality of the existence of God and knowledge of God. So what we see for Kreskas and what we're gonna see also for Avo next week the focus is not on this Aristotelian knowledge of God and its human intellectual perfection in order to achieve Olam Haba and engage in this intellectual communion with God. But for Kreskas, he's saying, this is obtainable for all Jews, including the masses. How does one come to love God? How does one come to connect to God? How does one ultimately achieve the purpose of the Torah and the purpose of humanity? By loving God through observance of his mitzvot. And so Kreskas, we see as an anti-Aristotelian, tries to revert back to a much purer form of a rabbinic conception of God and a rabbinic relationship with God that's achieved through observance of the mitzvot. And he explains his hierarchy of beliefs to come to an understanding of God, not purely from an intellectual perspective, but have an understanding about what the Torah entails, have an understanding about what the giver of the Torah um, it, how it, what the giver of the Torah should be conceived, ultimately not to have this intellectual perfection, but rather so one can worship him appropriately and thereby um, achieve spiritual as opposed to intellectual perfection. What we're going to see next week, and what's interesting in the last part of the Middle Ages, in this 15th century Jewish philosophy, that's um, reflectant of Yosef Alibo and his contemporaries, and so we're going to see that Albo kind of pulls back and has a moderate perspective, a moderate position between the rationalist Maimonideans and the anti-Aristotelians like Crestas. And so Albo tries to kind of forge a path in between where he certainly reflects a strong Maimonidean influence and values philosophy, but not rational philosophy to the exclusion of the spiritual connection with God. So we see really Kreskas was Albo's teacher. Now Kreskas certainly is influential to Albo, but Albo also deviates from Kreskas in important ways. So what we're gonna look at next week, and this is kind of the most familiar of um, uh, entire works on dogma, uh, we're gonna see the Sefer Tarim. Yosef Albo in the 15th century, a student of Kostin Kreskas wrote the Book of Principles because as he participated in the Tortosa Disputation, he saw that the Jews of his time totally lacked a uniform system of dogma. And therefore he wrote, and it has become a classic in the corpus of medieval Jewish philosophy, the Book of Principles in order to publicize an accessible system of dogma for all Jews. And it's a system of dogma that we still um, continue to study today. And so we're gonna see how Abu takes this chart, this course, that reflects a more moderate position, but certainly incorporates some of Rambam's philosophy, but also shows what was lacking in his Aristotelian system, and incorporates that of Kasai Kreskas that we saw today with regard to the pure, more spiritual form of Oma's relationship with God, but also deviates from Kreskas in important ways. And we'll have a look at that together um, next week as we continue our journey through the late Middle Ages.
have a great week and hopefully I'll see you next week when we discuss Algo. Thank you very much. Sure.